Hello and welcome back to a brand new DNF1 F1 podcast. I hope that you're all doing well and as always thank you once again for being here. It's been a little bit of a break for us. We had some content planned but we've been having some technical issues the last couple of weeks so we do apologize for the mini hiatus if you like but it's the F1 summer break. We down tools for a couple of weeks. I don't think I don't think we've had a break on this podcast of this length of time since we started recording this uh, three and a bit years ago. So thanks for bearing with us. Um, We hope that you guys are doing okay, but we are back with normal content, normal services resumed, and we are going to kick things off in this episode with a mid-season review of the F1 2023 season. Now, we know a lot of people have done theirs already. We haven't done ours yet, and I'm sure many of you that listen to this show would have been eagerly awaiting our mid-season report and review of the teams and drivers so far. Joining me on the panel, as always, we have Courtney Pine and we have Lee Wallington joining me. And Gentlemen, first of all, how how have you been? How, what have you been up to in the F1 summer break? Any barbecues going on like Christian Horner maybe? Or, uh, or what have you been up to, Lee? Uh, for me, it's just been filling in the Formula 1 void with some Formula 1 gaming. Um, obviously, nowhere as experienced as uh, likes of Max Verstappen with his virtual racing. Obviously, I don't have the rig for that either. But you get the drift. Got to fill it in with some online racing, virtual racing but, um, and just fill that gap and try not to crash. <laughs> yeah, trying not to crash is uh, it's harder than it sounds, but yeah. uh, good to see that you've managed to keep your eye in on uh, the motorsport side, at least, even if it is on the sim rig. Courtney, how have you been, mate? Have you been joining the summer break so far? Yeah, I've been doing a kite, but I have to say, Adam, I, I, I couldn't think of anything worse than, um, than attending one of uh, Christian Orner's barbecues. Thankfully, I never will be, but... Oof, it 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 would uh, it it would take a lot of uh, Dutch courage, no pun intended, to uh, sit through one of those. Yeah, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I I love a good barbecue, regardless of who's doing it. To be honest, so I'd probably be partial to it. I don't think Christian would mind too much, but he'd probably rather you leave the Mercedes shirt at home, Courtney, and perhaps <laughs> uh, keep your opinions of his drivers to yourself, perhaps or his team by and large, and just sit there and enjoy the hamburger or whatever you're partial to. Enjoy, barbecue, enjoy the catering budget. <laughs> well that's it you probably t- top down how much you spent on this or how much this cost christian oh that's going to add up to that on the on the old budget cap you know you're not going to be able to claim that back and uh yeah all in good fun of course but of um as i said you know it's been a nice nice opportunity whilst we've been having some technical issues to relax uh sit back Focus on things not necessarily Formula One related. I, I can honestly say I don't think there's been that much news going on in the F1 world at this point in time. There's been a few rumours in the air as you get in the summer break. Uh, there's been rumours around Sir Lewis Hamilton potentially agreeing a new contract with Mercedes, of course, when that is confirmed. Um, some rumours are saying it might be confirmed before the Dutch Grand Prix. We'll obviously talk about that probably in the preview for that race, which is coming, of course, next week as F1 comes back to us. Uh, the weekend after this one, at the point that you're listening to this too. Anyway, as I was saying, mid-season review. And what we've done for this mid-season review, guys, is we have all given letter grades, like we did last season. For those of the, you that remember, I did this episode with Mark from the Scuderia F1 podcast. Um, and we gave letter grades of each of the teams on how we think they have fared this season. And we've measured this against what their expected performance would have been at the start of the season versus where they're currently at. So this is not going to be one of those where, um, because Red Bull are winning this championship, they get the highest grade and someone like Haas, for example, get an average grade because they're currently in P8, for example. It's more going to be relative to how we think they should be performing. So what we've done is the three of us have all put in our individual grades for each team and we've combined all of them, to get an average grade for each team. And we're going to talk about each of those teams, what we think they've done well, what we think they can improve on, perhaps some dynamics with their drivers, all of that going into it. So hope you guys enjoy it. Of course, do feel free to play along with us. Leave uh, in the comments section if you're watching this on YouTube, or even if you're not, head over to the YouTube channel, get in the comments section, and let us know your letter grades for each of the F1 teams for this mid-season review. So first things first, we're going to do this in descending order, um, or actually ascending order, I should say. 
Yes, that's right. Thanks, Lee. Um, I always get those two confused sometimes when I say it almost like flammable and inflammable, but they mean the same thing. But obviously, in this example, it doesn't. Um, there is a clear distinction. First of all, Alpha Tauri currently last in the Constructors' Championship with only three points at this point in time. We've given them a D grade. Um, Lee, what would you, uh, what does a D grade suggest for Alpha Tauri in your mind? Uh, for me, the D grade suggests that for themselves, firstly, is that they would have uh, found that so far this season it's been disappointing. It's not got, they haven't got the results they were expecting. They haven't got um, top of the car issues and car performance that they believe they may have taken a step into this season. Um, obviously there's the, the change in the, the driver's, um, situation that obviously with their new one, the signing at the start of the year that didn't work out as they planned. I uh, say, so, and obviously the driver swap uh, mid season, which is obviously very Red Bull risk and how they manage their driver academy, but is still a change of circumstances. So it's just been a from the start, a, a, a not up to expectations from themselves or from their fans. Yeah, I mean, in, in your mind, Courtney. As I said, we've given them a D rating. The expectation was that AlphaTauri were going to struggle this season. But despite that, for me, I feel that this is very much a must-try-harder grade rather than saying they've been terrible. Um, what would you say today? Do you agree with that? Oh, I agree. I think um, the, the sheer performance hasn't been good enough. You know, f- for a team that we know they want to do their own thing away from Red Bull, but they have that Red Bull connection. And seeing Red Bull achieving what they currently are and seeing Alpha Tauri, seeing the gap as big as it's ever been between the two set teams does say a lot in its own right. But also when it comes to grading the teams, um, you also got to look at the performance of the drivers and Yuki Tsunoda, if it wasn't for Yuki Tsunoda, I reckon I'd be a D minus. I think Yuki's performance is this season and obviously the arrival of Danny Ricciardo will hopefully give the team a lift. But I think some of the individual performances from Yuki Tsunoda this season have only been a notable achievement for them. Well, I mean, the Belgian Grand Prix is a prime example of that with Yuki Tsunoda. Managed to get into the points and, you know, Ricardo put in a stellar performance in his uh, debut for the team, if you like, um, since, of course, it was Toro Rosso all that time ago when he drove for them many years ago. Um, it, it showed that there were signs with this Alpha Tauri team that they can, you know, produce some decent performances. And I don't think it's... Well, I don't think... You know, you look at the... Is it the worst car on the grid? I, I think, on average, it has been... But you can argue a case that when things come together and the team get things right, along with the drivers, that they can challenge for points and sometimes they can get them as well. So, you know, for me, I I wouldn't be so bold as to say they've been absolutely dreadful, but I think there's just been elements of this team and this car that they have struggled and they just need to do a better job. Um, But there are some shining moments. As I said, Sonoda has been a huge highlight for Alfa Tauri this season. He's really established himself in that team. Maybe not the team leader at this point in time because Ricardo has come in and it's changed the dynamic a little bit. But you take that, you take the De Vries element as well, which really didn't work out. And if you want to put a positive spin on everything, there is certainly room for improvement with this team. Um, Lee, Courtney made a good point about the connection with Red Bull. And in the last two seasons, Alpha Tauri were on quite a high coming into these new regulations, but they were very bold and ambitious with trying to go their own way rather than do what Haas have been doing for years and Alfa Romeo to a degree in, in following the Ferrari method. You know, Racing Point, before they become Aston Martin, were very much adopting the Mercedes method, as were Williams, to help them get a leg up on the competition. Alpha Tauri were very bold to, to go away from that Red Bull characteristic, one that worked so well for them to try something else. And it hasn't really worked out for them at all. And in your mind, do Alvatari need to consider returning to those, adopting those Red Bull characteristics within reason, of course, in order to change their fortunes in maybe not the second half of the season, but looking further forward at their car development? I think uh, it's definitely going to be on the cards uh, for them. Uh, if they're not already having those conversations they will be having them, um, especially from the senior management level. Although they are an independent team, uh, they are still part of the Red Bull family. And that comes with expectations and what they've got to deliver. 
um, being AlphaTauri, obviously the clothing brand of Red Bull. And even that's uh, going to be changing as the team name is going to be changing. And they've already announced that. So there's going to be a lot of internal review and processing. If you believe some of the current rumors coming through this, the silly season of the summer break that's now we're starting to get into gear, then there's rumors that Red Bull are trying their hardest to basically get this year's car into whatever AlphaTauri will be called next year. And they can just run the car concept, which is obviously illegal, but there's a, in that, how I've described it, but Red Bull are working on a way to get within the rules to do that. Um, I think one of the ways to try and argue is it's not an actual different team. It is still a Red Bull team. And therefore, it's not a change of IP because it's Red Bull. But they're, they're, I'm sure we'll see, hear more about those uh, rumours as they develop. Um, but I definitely think some concept changes will be coming to Alpha Tauri in the future. Yeah, that's something that confused me a little bit because I remember Crofty talking about this on the Sky F1 podcast. And I was always under the impression that what Alpha Ta- what Red Bull want to do with Alpha Tauri and basically give them an RB19. If you're not, yeah, the RB19. Yeah. Um, and, and then use that next season. I thought, surely that's illegal. Like, I know there are certain listed parts that teams can use, but I remember there was a lot of backlash, particularly with Alpha Tauri. Obviously, Racing Point took this one step way too far when they copied the Mercedes W11 or basically, you know, uh, and they got penalized for that. So, and, and of course, you know, the relationship Haas and Ferrari enjoy it together. Everyone's always been scrutinizing that. So that surprised me. But it would be interesting to see how that pans out because I suppose if Red Bull are going out there and, and suggesting possibly that that's what they want to do with AlphaTauri to bring them further up the order and make them a more lucrative franchise for prospective buyers in the future or whether they want to do that or not, obviously that is going to be something that AlphaTauri will certainly want to get on with in terms of turning their fortunes around in the second half of the season. Um, quick note on Daniel Ricciardo, Corny. As I said, he's come in thrown in at the deep end a little bit, but obviously this is what he would have wanted to try and get himself back in the fold for a potential seat at Red Bull. In the second half of the season, while we've seen glimpses of what he can do, are we expecting this to be a game changer for Alpha Tauri or is it down to more what they can get out of this car rather than who's actually driving it at the moment? Um, I I guess you could say it's a bit of both because we all know that the freeze, we wanted him to do well but he simply wasn't doing well enough for the team. Um, you, you'd expect Daniel to get the big results. Um, with the Daniel Vold certainly did. We saw it during the um, Mercedes dominance, whenever Mercedes had a bit of an off weekend or, you know, were crashing into each other. Daniel Ricciardo would usually be one of the first guys to pick up the pieces, get a race win, an unexpected podium here and there when Red Bull went in a position to win on raw pace. So we know he's capable of bringing the big results that Alpha Terry going to need in the second half of the season. So it all depends which version of Daniel Ricciardo we see. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have to uh, wait and see what we get from them in the second half of the season. Alpha and Mayo now, and we gave them a D rating as well. Although, if I'm honest, guys, even though we gave them the same grade as Alpha Terry, I feel like there is rationale for, to give Alpha and Mayo even a D minus to a degree. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because whilst they have been better than Alpha Tauri so far in the first half of this season, you could argue that the, the expectation of Alfa Romeo was considerably higher than what we were expecting from Alpha Tauri. And, and as it stands, other than a few bigger performances from Bottas earlier in the season when he finished, what was it, eighth place in Bahrain and Joe one or two races this season when they've done well, they've massively been underwhelming in my opinion. And as I said, if it wasn't for a few of those surprising results, I think they could very much easily be justified to be bottom of this championship. Um, I mean, what did you make of the first half of the season, Courtney? Uh, You know how I feel about Alfa Romeo as a team. (laughs) That's why I asked you. (laughs) Since since Leclerc left, you know, I call that team the the vanilla team. There's nothing about them. I, I just get the feeling or the impression that Alfa Romeo are just there. They should show up, be a part of, of F1, don't have any real ambition, you know, get get the money and sponsorship deals that come with it. And this is exactly why Kimi Raikkonen loved his time at Alfa Romeo, because he could do just that. Just He said it himself. He'd just show up, you know, race a relatively uh, fast car, I'll use that term uh, with a very big pinch of salt. 
um, pick up his wages and go home. It just seems to be the identity that Alfa Romeo um, have. Um, with these new regulations coming in, I was hoping that teams like Alfa Romeo and Alfa Tauri, we've already mentioned, this would give them the impetus to maybe, you know, compete a bit more often because the neutral fans, we want to see as many teams battling each other as possible. It seems like these teams are just sticking with their old ways, maybe surprising us at the beginning, get a couple of shock results and then get out um, get out, out developed by, you know, the usual mob um, further up. So it's disappointing, but at the same time, I'm not surprised. Yeah, I mean, last season they started on a higher platform you know they were the team that were challenging the big teams at the front and you know Bottas in particular was able to put that car in p7 most of the time early on the season then they started to fall away the start of this season Bottas I think he surprised a lot of people getting p8 in bar and I don't think that really went with the form that being said they've really been nowhere near that I can only think of two races this season where they've actually been pretty handy in terms of pace and that was Hungary, which was a circuit I think we expected them to be good at because it was low drag, low, you know, low speed corners. They were going to be good there. But then Canada as well. And that surprised me because I didn't think they were going to be strong there either. Monaco, they were surprisingly underwhelming, even though they should have been stronger there. And I think that kind of says the story about Alfa Romeo. It's, it's, there's, there are expectations there to be in the mix, but overall it's been rather underwhelming. And I wonder. I wonder if it's because there is an element here that this, this transition that they're currently going through, you know, going from Alfa Romeo to, you know, back to Sauber and obviously what that's going to be, um, you know, in, in 2024 onwards and then eventually becoming Audi as a full works team as part of the Sauber program. That transition process could be slowing things down in the short term and the priority could be elsewhere to try and make sure they're as competitive as possible in the future but obviously it leaves a lot to be desired in the short term what do you reckon Lee is that a factor at the moment or are Alfa Romeo just not really performing as well as they should be I do definitely think that's a factor um at the moment um if you look at other categories and I'm going to use Formula E's example um before Mercedes joined Formula E um there was another team that was running the Mercedes um unit the powertrain, um, but it wasn't Mercedes. The, it was going through the transition year, and then it became Mercedes. Um, so it's, I think, uh, uh, and then the transition year, the team was completely underperforming. And I think right now, yes, we still got multiple years before Audi joined the sport, but Formula One's a lot bigger sport than Formula E. And I think the transition is not the the performance of the car is not the priority. It's about getting the facilities in order, um, investing in. Uh, obviously the facilities again which is obviously it's still affected to a degree with the budget cap obviously some teams are arguing it shouldn't be but they're still affected so i don't think investing in the car is the top priority because they want to be up and running and ready for audi to come in and go yep there's a great results for our team this is obviously what we want as a brand the years before we don't really care because that's not that's not us um so i think that's really going to affect the team's performance and obviously it's not a hot seat now, but it's going to be coming a hot seat in a couple of years, um, being a drone for one of these new constructors. Um, and we know what Audi can do in other sports. It's just this year is just a, um, it's just obviously a waste. And especially, as you said, they started off so strongly last year. It's just not being replicated this season. Yeah, very much so. Um, Courtney, a quick one on a point that you mentioned. You talked about Kimi Raikkonen and getting to that point in his career. As you jokingly said on the Netflix um documentary of drive to survive once where it's just a hobby for him you know he's already won his world title he's won many races he doesn't need to worry about really trying to go for broke like he was in his younger days and just enjoy himself and enjoy his f1 career i can't help but feel right now that we are seeing that a little bit in valtteri bottas you know not to the same degree of course i think valtteri very much still cares about his standing in f1 but when valtteri bottas was signed last season I think a lot of people were kind of hoping that we were going to see the Valtteri that we saw at the Williams team. You know, the shackles are off. He doesn't have the pressure that he would have faced being at Mercedes and winning Constructors' Championship and obviously having aspirations to win a Drivers' World Championship, but never really being able to put a sustained challenge against the likes of Sir Lewis Hamilton, who was, you know, far above him in terms of, you know, their overall output over the course of the season. And now he's in an environment 
where even though he's still outperforming his teammate, uh, I think in qualifying in the races, I think Valtteri is eight races to four up on Joe Guan Yu in both elements. But I can't help but feel that Valtteri at this point in time, there doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be a desire or a hunger from him to try and carry this team or drag it forward whilst it potentially is going through this transition. It almost seems like a perfect recipe here where we've got a driver who they're happy to keep on for the next couple of years um, without having to worry about trying to push the team forward until it's ready to have a go in 2026, coupled with a driver who perhaps feels his F1 career will only last as long as the 2026 season or just before that, and he's quite happy to just go around driving and being an F1 driver. Well, look, these drivers are only human at the end of the day, and most people, if they're in a work environment where there is an ambition to improve or, you know, ambition to be the best version of yourselves that is going to rub off on the employee and by definition the drivers are employees and if you're working around that on a regular basis you are gonna unfortunately pick up that lazy habit and I, and I do feel that Valtteri is going through a lazy phase and I feel the only way he will get out of that are either um, Alfa Romeo having more ambition or Alfa Romeo getting fed up towards the back end of the season and, and starting to, you know, threaten Valtteri and say, look, if these, if these performances continue to next season, we'll, we'll find a replacement for you. Because we saw the same thing happen last season. He was he's pretty much just, just turned up for the sake of it. We, we were regularly commenting and saying that the guy's already on the beach halfway through the season. And it was only towards the end of the season when Alfa really started to pick up some points to you know, get themselves up the midfield in the in the constructors that they actually started to put in some decent performances and it wouldn't surprise me if we saw that happen again. Yeah, I mean we haven't seen the customary photo of Valtteri Bottas swimming naked in a lake just yet in the summer break. I mean there's still time of course, but uh he's been very quiet on that front. So perhaps it is something he needs to reflect on or, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But uh yeah, interesting times at Alfa Romeo in the short term. Let's move on to Haas. So overall, we gave them a C on average. And I think, you know, you could argue a case to score them higher or lower, depending on how you see things. I think C was a fairly fair grade for them. And I think it's on the basis of the fact that whilst there is the expectation for Haas to be in the mid-table fight, they've had some peaks, but majority of them, if not all of them, have come on a Saturday. And in the races, they've been absolutely dreadful and fallen further back down the order. And for me, it does raise the question of where are Haas currently going at the moment? And even though at this point in time, they probably are where we expected them to be. Um, Lee, a large part of that has been Nico Hulkenberg coming to this team. Um, clearly, based on what we've seen and the reservations I certainly had and others had about axing Mick Schumacher, Hulkenberg signing for Williams has turned out to be the right decision. Yeah, the decision... Uh obviously been the correct decision um i didn't i, I completely agreed with uh, nico coming back um to just put that out there but the he's a, he's been brilliant and obviously kevin completely dominated mick and nico's coming and he's not dominated kevin but he's definitely put, giving some um embarrassment to kevin especially on the saturday but kevin obviously closes the gap on the the sunday which is where the points count um but the what they've done as the two drivers, I think, is they've really reached that harmony. And we did worry immediately about the, the harmony between the two drivers because they have a history um, of certain phrases, which I'm not going to obviously repeat. Um, so, But they're getting on, they're working, they're delivering. They may not the car may not be different performance, but they're really working well, I think, as a driver pairing. Um, and I think that's one of the things that you can really stand out from them is although the car has had some up moments in performance, the, the drivers, I think, are doing a really solid job and you you know, well, we're just talking about um, Alpha uh, Romero and how Valtteri um, has been let down. But I can't say that Kevin and uh, Nico have been uh, disappointing in their performances at all. They've been really solid um, this uh, so far this season. Yeah, it very much feels at the moment that the drivers, you know, some days are doing really well, some days not so much. But it does feel like they're limited by what the car is capable of. And, and then evidently, like the Ferrari, we know that the Haas is going to be a lot stronger on a Saturday than it is on a Sunday. Although the drop-off that we see from Ferrari is nowhere near as large as the drop-off that we see from Haas at the moment. And, 
you know, looking further forward, if you're trying to find positives for Haas at the moment, it is quite concerning because whilst they are hoping to improve this car and aren't restricted by the budget limitations that they once had a few years ago, the problem seems to be that because this is very much based on the Ferrari concept, because Ferrari are trying to figure this out, Haas won't even have the faintest clue of what they're going to be able to do because if they try anything that's innovative and goes against what Ferrari are trying to do, it's not going to work for them going forward. So, Courtney, how do you see this going for Haas right now in the second half of the season? Because, as I said, I've outlined all those issues that they've got in the short term and how they're going to develop this car. But there is a realistic opportunity for them to finish P7 in the Constructors' Championship right now. But you could also flip that and say, well, the others have a larger scope to try and improve than them, and they could fall further down the order. How do you see things going for Haas in the second half of the season? Um, I, I think the driver pairing they have will make the difference come the end of the season. Um, you can see down there, there is actually quite a tight battle uh, between themselves, Afro and obviously Williams, who we're going to go on to uh, talk about in a minute. Um, I feel that they, they have two drivers that could bring home the points, bring home, the, again, those, those mm-hmm. that consistency. I feel that they have compared to the other driver pairings. I think Williams have probably one of the best drivers in that, should we say, that category of F1 at the moment. But then the other guy, no offence to him, I think he's one of the worst. Whereas with um, Haas, they have two steady eddies. And, you know, come a chaotic race, should we say, a race that's affected by rain, uh, lots of silly mistakes happening, they're going to be the guys that will make the difference. and <clears throat> Sorry. They're going to be the guys that will make a difference. And as much of a shame it was to see Mick Schumacher leave, this is exactly why Haas made that decision. So I think it will be um, a good decision overall that they did um, move on Mick Schumacher because as much of a shame as it was, the fact that Nico Hulkenberg is already proven to be a lot more consistent. And on a, on a weekend where other teams slip up, you would expect a driver like Nico Hulkenberg to make the difference. And as I said already, you've got, you're in a position now, we've got three or four teams very close to each other. And I do, I feel that that pairing could be the difference between seventh and, or, or ninth, shall we say, for Haas. So let's move on to Williams. And we've given them a B overall. And as I said, we've, we've got to remember when we're doing these grades that this is more about how they're performing relative to expectations. And there's a fair argument here that Williams on some days have the slowest car on the grid. But then there are other days where they turn up to low drag circuits or circuits that, you know, allow them to really flex the muscles of their strengths. And they seem to perform pretty well. And coupled with the fact that Alex Albon has done a remarkable job so far this season. He's really shown his qualities. I don't think Logan Sargent's been that bad either to certain uh, respects. Williams seems to be this team right now that when they are in a position of ascendancy and position of strength, more often than not, if not always, they are taking advantage of it. And that's when they're scoring points at the moment. And that's why they're P7 in the constructors. And I wouldn't rule them out finishing in that position as well. It's a team that's making real good progress at the moment. I think the only one time I think Williams really missed an opportunity was when Alex Albon made that mistake when he was running P6 at Melbourne early in the season. Other than that, I think they've been brilliant in that regard. We all saw the photos of their floor and how simplistic it looked compared to some of the other cars like the Mercedes and the Red Bull. And I think it raised a lot of red flags, pardon the pun. On, on the Williams. But despite those ailments and those disadvantages, they've been doing a very, very good job to take advantage when they're in a position of strength. Um, I mean, Lee, let's, let's come to you on Williams. How would you assess the first half for their season? I think um, for them, it's been a brilliant season. Um, obviously, for the last several years, ignoring the actual rule change um, for from t- the end of 21 to 22, Williams have been the slowest team. Um, it's always been, oh, will they make it up? Will they make a step up? Will they make a step up? And they've been closing it, give and take the gap. So being in the midfield fight, I think is brilliant. Um, they're no longer circling 
last. They're no, they're in the qualifying battle. Yes, there are some circuits that don't suit their car because, as you said, the car has not got the downfalls of some of the, the top of team, top team, especially on the floor aspect. But they've been in there, and I think that's a brilliant, uh, um, and they're probably way beyond the expectations of where they think they'll be fighting for in this year's championship. So for them, this has been a brilliant result. Obviously, Alex has come into his own and is brilliant, and he's obviously delivering what we all thought he could do um, and hoped he could have done when he was at Red Bull. And he's just at home in this team, and he's finding his feet and building his confidence against strength to strength. Unfortunately, I wouldn't say the same about his teammate. But this is a team, I think, it's, at the moment, is things are looking up and ha- could have a positive future in the long term. Um, and it's, re- I think, it's just been a really Im- um, impressive first half of the season. Courtney, what are your thoughts on James Vowles so far this season? Because he made the big move going over from Mercedes to Williams to take up his first team principal role. Um, it, it was a bit of a risky move because much more experienced people in that particular role have gone to Williams and completely fallen to the wayside. And and there's always been issues of progress and have they been able to make steps going forward or even try and develop a synergy between different departments um, that obviously work together to produce a car that is, of course, the sum of its parts at Williams. And so far this season, Williams have been very, very good. There have been signs of progress. People seem to be on the right wavelength of each other. And in terms of a litmus test, it does speak volumes about the effect that James Vowles has already had as team principal so far with his team. Uh, What have you made of his signing so far for Williams this year? It's a great question and it fits in exactly what I've been saying about Williams' competitors, let's say. Um, James Vowles is what you call a statement signing. We hear that a lot in uh, in the football community. And that's exactly what he is. He's a statement signing. It's, 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 a, it's a statement from Williams to say, we want to be a lot more competitive in comparison to some of the other teams I just mentioned, Alpha Tauri, Alpha Romeo and, and Haas. They're not making these um, kind of uh, recruitment uh, decisions that show that ambition to improve, whereas Williams are. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a young and upcoming driver, let's say, um, let's say Alex Albon moves on, and um, Valtteri Bottas moves on, and you're an upcoming. Let's say, let's say, um, Oli Beerman, and he has the choice between um, Williams and Alfa Romeo. I'm sorry, if I was Oli Beerman, I'm choosing Williams all day. And it's just, and it is, it's just that energy, that 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 selling point, and and that you know, that want to push on. And and I, I feel, and this this is one of the reasons why Alex Albon's been able to perform so well because. Albon and Williams are pretty much in the same mindset. They're both in the rebuilding process. They both want to be back to where they feel they should be. And that's why we're seeing this partnership work so well. Yeah, it does seem that way with Williams. And, you know, we talk about James Fowles. I think it's proven to be one of the signings of the season so far. And, you know, it was a bold choice at the time. I think Williams had kind of humoured all these experienced heads that had been there and done it in other teams and done things even outside of Formula 1, if you're talking about um, uh, Jos Caputo, for example. And it didn't really work out through one reason or another, depending on who you believe. With James Vowles, as I said already, you know he's addressed issues where Williams was struggling, not necessarily just, oh, the facilities aren't up to code, because we always hear this story about Williams are 20 years behind everybody else in terms of infrastructure. And I, and I get that. But at the same time, you do have good people there. The facilities are still of a decent standard, even if they're not quite um, the latest tech or top of the range or anything or cutting edge technology, if you like. You can still do a lot with quite, you know, with that amount. And to be able to maximise those efficiencies and get people working at the right um, on, on the same hymn sheet, if you like, convincing people like Pat Fry to come back and leave Alpine, you know, that's obviously a huge statement signing in, in itself and that will help Williams going forward. It's de- definitely a team going in the right direction. And Alex Albon is very much at the epicentre of that as a driver. And, and as you said, Courtney, if you're a young driver or even a driver of decent quality looking for the next move, I wouldn't exactly say it's a bad idea to go to Williams in the next few years, depending, of course, if they keep continuing to rise at the level they are at this point in time. But we'll have to wait and see because there are still plenty of weaknesses that they have to address. They're a long way from where they want to be, of course. Let's move on to our team. We're starting to get towards some of the business end of the field at the moment. We gave them a D. Now... 
a bit of a background on Alpine this season. This was a team where Lauren Rossi, the former CEO, before he got moved on to special projects, and I'm not going to go into depth as to what on earth has gone on with the management structure because we had a whole episode dedicated to that one. But amidst the merry-go-round, or before that, if you like, he set huge ambitions to try and become the fourth fastest team on the grid, or at the very least, be much, much closer to the top three. As it stands, Alpine are a long way from that much further away from that than they were last season. And the team that they obviously wouldn't have given a second thought to in McLaren being a challenger have usurped them in only a few races owing to their season development. There's been huge changes to the management structure. The team have woefully underperformed, not only on the car, but both of their drivers, with the exception of Monaco, where Ocon got on the podium and Gasly got solid points in that race as well. They've hardly been in a position where you'd say, yeah, that's more like it from Alpine. Maybe Melbourne, but they threw that away as well by a silly mistake from their two drivers. So overall, we've got an outfit here with lofty ambitions, but no real plan or patience to see that through at the moment. And the fact that we're starting this all again at Alpine, despite the fact we've given them a D rating, doesn't really inspire me with confidence that they're going to be better in the second half of the season. That's my damning review of Alpine so far. And that's just the first six months of 2023. There's a lot to get in there. Um, Lee, what are your thoughts on Alpine? Why have we given them a D grade? Well, they had a very solid season last year. Um, So the thoughts going into this year was they're they're trying to take the next step up and close the gap to the the top three. Um, Obviously, we had the question mark about the compatibility of the two drivers. But it was more about Come on, they they could actually close this gap. They could be an annoyance to uh, Red Bull, Mercedes, and Ferrari. That c- can they do this? And they didn't. And Aston Martin came in, storming in from behind and became that nuisance. But as you already alluded to, McLaren came in and uh, started doing that. And Alpine have just they f- f- got stuck in Alpine land as I put through most of the season, and that's where they stayed. But Alpine land has got further and further away from the front of the grid. Um, and I just think it's it's just gone to complete shambles. It started off bad and it's just got worse and worse. And I fully expect it to get worse and worse. Um, that by the next season, it's gonna a lot will have changed. Yeah, it's crazy because you've got McLaren who have got almost double the points of Alpine and. Even when McLaren was struggling, they still found a way to be ahead of Alpine. They had that crazy result in Melbourne at the time where they got some big points, which put them ahead. But ever since then, everyone thought Alpine will just get them back and it will be fine. They'll be comfortably P5. All right, not where they want to be, but at least they're going to be best of the rest. They are in that no man's land position already this season, but they're a long way ahead of those training behind them at the back. And they're a long way behind the five teams ahead of them at at the front as well, and deservedly so. And... I must say, the driver element was a factor, but I can't honestly say that those two have really been as much of a problem. It's more about what they've done on their own and the team coupled with that, that has been an issue. Um, Courtney, what does the future look like for Alpine in the second half of the season? Because I, I could honestly go out and say that they might be in the points, but they could be the best of the rest, but that's about as good as I can think of. And they'd have to put it all together as well. Yeah, I just want to make a, a slight uh, a backtrack to last season. Um, we, we was all mystified when uh, Fernando Alonso abruptly left Alpine for Aston Martin. And then you had the, the shambles of Alpine announcing Oscar Piastri as their driver, you know, wanted to drive for another team. And it makes you wonder, it makes you wonder, obviously these were two drivers that were in and around the team. It makes you wonder if they, if they will have had a good understanding of the, the culture of the team, the ambitions of the team, was there a toxic culture at the team which made you know made both drivers not want to be a part of it anymore? And then you have a look at and see with hindsight is obviously a powerful thing, but you're seeing Aston Martin take big strides forward and McLaren take big strides forward, whilst Alpine they're they're just falling apart. Apart from you know the thing we did expect to fall apart, which was a driver pairing, but it, it just shows were, have these issues been sort of bubbling for a long time now. And, you know, even with the two drivers without um, good management, if they were to come together on track, who's going to be the figurehead to control any sort of fires between the two drivers if they are to eventually come together? 
Yeah, it's a very strange one at Alpine right now. And and as we said already, it doesn't look like one that's going to be resolved anytime soon. So, you know, Lauren Rossi at the Miami Grand Prix famously was very critical of his team to the press about the fact that they were falling behind and they didn't want to adjust their targets to match where they currently were. I think they might have to in the short term at least, but this is Alpine we're talking about. It, who even knows what the project is right now? So uh, we'll have to wait and see. McLaren, and this was a hard one to grade because it's very easy to have a bit of recency bias here with McLaren and say that they've been excellent, but you can't ignore the way the season started for them and the reasons for that. They're currently sitting P5 in the Constructors' Championship. The way the current form is going, I'd be surprised if they ended up there at this point in time, but we've given them a B so far the first half of the season. And as I said already, I think this is coupled by by two elements of the last few races since the Austria upgrades. They've been incredibly good. They've been challenging Red Bull, Silverstone, Lando Norris getting that podium, Oscar Piastri P4. Oscar Piastri was brilliant in Belgium until his race ended abruptly with that collision with Carlos Sainz. And, you know, Norris did a great recovery to get in the points, despite the fact McLaren went the wrong way on setup. So there is plenty of room for progress with McLaren. And there's plenty of potential here for them to really make headway this season. But of course, we can't ignore how difficult the season was at the start. We can't ignore the fact that, you know, the start of the season, they or before the season even started, they addressed issues with their car. They knew it was going to be a dud, the concept. So they went back, started again. And they've now got to a point where they are producing a very good car with more upgrades to come to make it even better. So... I think a B, probably all things considered, is probably close to, I think, what the right grade should be for them, personally. Um, but, but Lee, how how do we assess McLaren's first half of the season? Um, do we focus on where they are now, or do we factor in the whole picture of where they were at the start of the season, and why they were in that position at the start of the season? Well, I, I, I think overall it, sh- it should be the, the big picture. Um, obviously, they let everyone know, and the fan base know that, hang on, the car we've got is um, a pile of unwanted scrap parts. Um, don't expect anything from this. And that's just being me polite there. Um, I'm well, sure that's Lando... They said, you know, that's what they said in, ma- in a matter yeah. of words, wasn't it? That Andrea Stella wasn't talking it up. Um, obviously, James Key wasn't even at the launch, which fed rumours at the times of his departure, which, of course, subsequently followed. And even Lando was saying, look... It's not going to be good early on. We're going to take a lot of pain here, but hopefully it will get better soon. Luckily for them, it has worked out that way. Oh yeah, very much so. Um, but it, so you have, they they knew the car that they had in the pipeline wasn't going to work. They admitted it and they made the the, the risky decision earlier on to go to scrap it. Let's just start again, which has obviously worked off now. But it was still a risk to abandon your concepts before the season before you even got the car on the on the road. Um. And through testing, but they they've done that, and they got really good results. Even though the car uh, shouldn't have been getting those results, and obviously that's come with some having some great drivers and Lando, as we know, can do some wonderful driving, and and obviously that helped them be ahead of Alpine when they shouldn't have been ahead of Alpine. But now the car and the upgrades have got there, and um, they're in a, a flying p- um, place. Um, and they're talking on the ascendancy. So you think it's a lot of foresight that the car is going to be where they wanted it to design a new car and deliver that and then have the drivers to put the results with when the car should be there. Um, and so I think overall, it's pretty, they've far exceeded expectations of where they thought they could have been at this point in the season. Courtney, we talked about Lando Norris a lot on this show. We've always praised him and highlighted how much potential this kid has and that he really could be a force to be reckoned with in F1 for years to come. Maybe we're at this point where we're starting to see that develop in the last few races and hopefully it lasts a bit longer than it is at the moment. But I want to focus a little bit on Oscar Piastri because this is a driver that, as we've already talked about last year, he dropped that huge bombshell saying that he was not going to be driving for Alpine and he ended up going to McLaren. And at the time, that probably proved to be quite a risk. As it stands now... That couldn't be further from the truth. And he's clearly made the right decision here. But this season, whilst there may not have been that much expectation on him, 
when the opportunities have come, and as we saw at the Belgian Grand Prix and even at the British Grand Prix as well, he is really starting to show why so many people were very interested in watching his progress in the junior single series as he flew through all of that and into Formula One. In the second half of the season, how do you think Oscar Piastri is going to fare, especially against a teammate like Lando Norris? I think it's going to be intriguing. Um, if if the rumours are true and uh, McLaren are expected to, you know, there's a, the, the rumours that McLaren could potentially challenge Red Bull at the end of the season. And McLaren are in a position where if they do have the car to challenge for a race win, they only have, only have one driver that's capable of doing it. They have two. We saw it during the sprint race. We know that Max's um, overall pace was too much for Oscar, but he just had the feeling if the pace was there, he would have been able to hold back Max. So it's encouraging to, um, moving forward to, to think that, look, we're actually probably looking at McLaren to give us more entertainment in the second half of the season if the rumours are true. And I'd love to see some great battles, uh, not only between Max and um, Lando, but also Oscar Piastri as well, because where where Lando has done so well this season, and we everyone loves Lando, so it's very easy for Oscar Piastri to go underneath the radar, but we've been talking about it for years, particularly you, Adam, you've been a fan for a long time. We know how much potential this lad has, and... With the right machinery, we seem they seem to have in the direction they're going in. I think we're going to be seeing plenty of opportunities for um, for Oscar to showcase his true talent. Yeah, I think it very much gives McLaren a much stronger position in terms of their future. Not just because they have two very very talented young drivers, but I think it's very easy for us to think of McLaren and think of Lando Norris and think that he is going to be imperative to whatever success they have. But with someone like Oscar Piastri, who's come into this team. Replace Daniel Ricciardo, all right, it wasn't his decision who he was going to replace. Even Australian F1 fans had just resided to not even paying too much attention to him because they thought, oh, well, he's not Ricciardo. You know, we, we don't like him for that. He's really come into this team. And even if it was a bit of a slow start, he's very much been the first to acknowledge when there have been issues. I think in, in the race in Jeddah, when he got tagged in that race, he didn't, you know, run to complain about this driver doing this to him. He was very much thinking about, okay, I, maybe I could have looked back and think about where I could put my car. He did something similar with Signs, even though he felt Signs had turned in on him and felt he was to blame. He also admitted that he was going to look back at that and think, oh, okay, well, can I put my car somewhere different in future? It, it's stuff like that that I think very much it goes uh, under the radar with a lot of F1 fans and, and people watching in. And the reality is we've got a driver here who seems to have all the right characteristics and qualities to be a serious driver going forward. And Lee, I, I, I'm intrigued to get your thoughts on this as well with Oscar Piastri, because as I said already, it does feel right now that with Piastri, McLaren aren't necessarily going to be held to ransom if they're not quite able to live up to the expectations of this project that they sold to Lando Norris when he signed that longer term deal a couple of years ago. Yeah, I mean, uh, Oscar um, obviously has great potential. Um, and I oh, know we though we talk about um, McLaren to be careful to hold on to Lando. If the uh, Oscar can keep on delivering how he's done so far the season, obviously he will grow and get better. This is only his first season. He's still a rookie. Um, I think the, the bigger question is, can McLaren hold on to Oscar? Um, and you think of the, the reason I'm saying that is who, you have to remember who his manager is. His manager is Mark Webber. There's Red Bull connections there. We know Red Bull aren't overly impressed with Sergio's performance this season. They go, oh, they're looking at Lando. But could they be looking at Oscar because he's had the rapid ascent through the lower categories? Um, and especially he keeps delivering. So at McLaren have two great drivers. One obviously a lot older, a bit more experienced than the other. But they need to re-deliver this project because they could end up losing both to um, to different teams or um, one may beat them to the, the best team on the grid at the moment. So it's a really a concern that um, Zach Brown, I'm sure, has already thought of. But And it has to really, obviously, emphasise to the team that they need to be delivering these results and improving to hold on to their, the talent that they've uh, managed to procure. I'm sort of wondering if Mark Webber would want to subject Piastri to Verstappen at Red Bull. I mean, this is a guy, bear in mind, that 
sat through the Vettel prime years. And obviously, you know, Vettel, uh, Weber retired on his own terms, but there were those obvious elements there where the team were very much favouring Seb over him. I'm just wondering if he'd want to put Piastri in that position with a benefit of his own knowledge. It's kind of like that um, that meme, I can't remember what film it is, Matthew McConaughey, where he's sort of smashing down the door, crying to his former self, saying, don't do this. It's almost like Weber doing this with Piastri, like, don't join Red Bull. I sat through the Vettel years. Verstappen's there, he'll eat you alive. But uh, what do you reckon, Courtney? Piastri at Red Bull, maybe? Mark Webber 2.0 against Verstappen? I, I can't help but agree with what you just said there, Adam. But at the same time, Red Bull looked like the team to beat in the next three, four years. So it all depends on the uh, the confidence that Piastri has. Um, but it's interesting when you, you know, going back on what we've just been saying about both the drivers. And, you know, if McLaren, you know, continue to show that ambition, because Lando's already said, you know, if, if McLaren had continued the way they were before, he would have been considering his future. But now the, the recent forms have made him think twice about it. And I do think hypothetically, if McLaren were to keep this driver pairing over the next two, three years, and let's say Lewis ends up um, leaving Mercedes, and it all depends on who replaces uh, Lewis at Mercedes, I would say that McLaren could potentially go on to have the best driver pairing on the entire grid. So if they get a Certainly decent enough out, car, yeah. if, they have, if they get a decent enough car, that puts them in a very good position for them to get back to really where they should be because... Younger fans, obviously, if you're not into, haven't been into, massively into F1 in the history of it, McLaren are one of the most successful F1 teams of all time. They have the facilities, they have the history to be challenging for championships, and they've gone through a real bad patch over the last decade or so. And it just seems like if all goes well, they can get back to that really where they should be. So let's move on to Ferrari. We've given them a C minus uh, for the first half of the season, and this is a team that's had a few podiums. They were expected to be Red Bull's best challenger at the start of the season, if not in a title fight red, with Red Bull. And if we take the car on its own, you know, it, it couldn't have been further from the truth. It's been woefully underwhelming. All these new innovations that Ferrari were going to bring to this car. And, and, and they've only recently got to the point where they're able to produce the same downforce levels as they were in their peak in 2022. So that's already a concern for them. But then you add on all the issues they've had with the strategy, reliability, the drivers making mistakes as well, rather than not capitalising on good positions that they find themselves in. Ferrari is struggling in P4 in this Constructors' Championship, when you could argue that they've had the second fastest car on the grid more often than any other team, with the exception, of course, of Red Bull, who are obviously fastest everywhere at the moment. And Ferrari have not been able to deliver on that so far. The potential was there for Ferrari, but... Unfortunately for Ferrari, they are being very Ferrari-like, as they have been in the past. Unfortunately, they just don't have an incredibly quick car to dance around those issues like they did last year. What's your assessment been of Ferrari so far, Lee? Is a C-minus justified for their first half? Well, I mean, we didn't have the the letter range to go down to F, but if they would, I'll give them an <laughs> F for Ferrari. Just make it it's mm-hmm. the only team that gets the F because it's just Ferrari. Ferrari are being, as you said, being Ferrari, they're being fabulous, but they're being also fabulously poor. Um, I can think of another adjective beginning with F <laughs> to describe them. <laughs> but they're they're just been um, having great races and poor races, great stray strategies and poor ones. Um, they they the drivers have done some great performances, but they've messed it up. The team harmony has been great at some tracks, and it's been it's complete mirror season between. How did the team and the drivers go from one to the next race? And uh, it's a real mystery how a team can be so up and down from even through the weekend, but um, through the different race weekends. That, as Adam already said, to be the second fastest at some, but some weekends they're not even in the top ten because there's just no performance. And the drivers can't get the the tires to work. And where's Ferrari gone? It's complete and utter mystery that they were fighting for the championship last year that Charles managed to keep second in the drivers championship it, not, they're not even going to be um, in the top five this year um, I'm bearing some reckless uh, for our resurgence after the summer um, so it's really a, a guess what's um, gone wrong which is why the rating so poor but as I said an F for Ferrari we should have just made it a special case for them yeah, 
pretty much so. I, I wouldn't have disagreed with that rating, quite frankly. But I, I agree with you. I, it's it's such a strange one this year for Ferrari because the car. The only thing that's changed for Ferrari this year compared to last year is the car is relatively slower than it was last year to the competition. That's I not think a good change. The, no, it's not a good change. <laughs> Absolutely no. Um, you know. All the issues that have plagued Ferrari last season and even in years before that are still occurring this season. But the difference is, is that they don't have the fastest car on the grid anymore. And even even though that more often than not, they seem to have the second fastest car on the grid. Hungary and, Bel- Hungary and Belgium are two prime examples of Ferrari's complications this season where they're either the second fastest team or they're the fifth fastest team or the strategy goes well and the strategy doesn't go well. Driver doesn't make mistakes, gets a good result in Charles Leclerc, and Carlos Sainz makes a mistake and, and gives up a bad result. It uh, gives up a good result and ends up finishing outside, you know, don't even finish the race. Obviously, you know, it's not just Sainz, both Leclerc and Sainz have been error prone so far this season. And, and this is where we end up with Ferrari. Uh, Courtney, what's got to change at Ferrari? Is, there, is it just one thing at Ferrari to try and turn things around or. Is there any light at the end of the tunnel for them, which may see them finish second in the constructors this season? Adam, no offense, mate, but we've been having these, we've been doing this podcast for three years now, and we've been asking ourselves these very questions throughout our time doing it because nothing seems to change. There were glimmers of hope last season. We know that um, Ferrari got hit badly by the technical directive halfway through the season. Thank you, Toto Wolf. Um, but. It's 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 not I'm good. I'm glad you for said it. it. <laughs> it's um, it's 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 not good enough. It, it's simply not good enough. And you know, I'm going to bring up one of the biggest sporting cliches that you could think of, and that is the table doesn't lie. Now, if you have a look at where uh, Ferrari are and constructors and where Mercedes are, you would say over the course of the season, Mercedes and Ferrari have been very similar on average on raw race pace. You see Mercedes comfortably in P2, and then you've got Ferrari blow Aston Martin. And you see how badly Aston Martin have been doing over the last few races. And that just says everything you need to know about where Ferrari are right now. Yeah, I think that's a pretty fair assessment, quite frankly. And uh, yeah, a lot for Ferrari to ponder. The car obviously is the priority to try and improve that, and they do have aspirations to do that beyond this season and next season they've been talking about. But we'd be very naive to think that having a faster car is going to turn Ferrari's fortunes around. It's only going to get them so far at this point in time. Aston Martin, A- minus for them on average. The biggest grade that we have given so far on the grid. And I think this is a very, very deserved one because... You know, people can say, oh, well, you know, Aston Martin started the season very strongly, five podiums out of the first six races, particularly for Fernando Alonso, but their form has dipped massively since the British Grand Prix. They have been comfortably the fourth fastest at that point, which is a lot lower than where they were earlier on in the season. But relatively speaking, none of us would have expected Aston Martin to be where they currently are right now. None of us certainly would have expected Aston Martin to have turned up to Bahrain with the second fastest car on merit and being able to capitalise and get those results in. Signing Fernando Alonso has been an absolute masterstroke for them. And even though Stroll has not quite been performing at the level they would have hoped, I know he had an injury to overcome as well, there are still positive signs for Aston Martin at this point in time. As it stands though, first half of the season, Lee, is an A-minus fair grade for Aston Martin? I think it's a... Uh, very fair grade for them. You, you, if you said to the three of us at the beginning of the season, Aston Martin's going to finish in the top five in the constructors' championship. All right, well, that's that's very impressive. Wouldn't expect that. I mean, they finished seventh. They're going to have to um, beat an Alpine. They're going to have to beat um, McLaren um, to 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 be able to that really hot prime fifth uh, spot which is obviously prior to we're going to be aiming for themselves um so it's right okay five but they're not fifth they're third and yes they were second for a while and they may not hold on to third but but like they're going to finish in the top five on bearing some miraculous resurgence from another team lower down the um the championship so it's a brilliant result even if they finish fifth so the fact that they're not there at this point in the season, brilliant result. Don't can't take that away from the the team and how they've developed this car. 
Yes, they may have not developed, kept up in the development race, but Fernando's done some brilliant racing. He's really brought back the, the team and obviously brought some life and vibrancy into the team and uh, and especially starting to ask questions about uh, Lance and what he did brings to the team, which do you think was the safest seat in the sport? Um, Bowing Max, obviously, because obviously I don't think Red Bull would do anything with <laughs> uh, firing Max or anything, but it's one of the safest seats in the sport. And questions are now being asked of, actually, can he do the performances we need to win a championship? Um, I think it's just a, a it's a brilliant result, regardless of uh, where they, they, they're going to finish it for Aston Martin. Yeah, I imagine those conversations are probably happening on the balcony, the furthest away from Lawrence Stroll's office in the new Aston Martin factory, but they are probably happening. Um, and, and that is going to be a concern. As I said, I think because Aston Martin are in a good position, perhaps... Not many people have voiced those concerns just yet, but they are seeing the standard in Fernando Alonso of a top-level driver that Aston Martin will certainly want in the future as and when Fernando Alonso decides decides to hang up his racing gloves. At the moment, Lance is not proving that he is capable of doing that. And Courtney, this is kind of the next point of Aston Martin's assessment the first half of the season because when we think of Aston Martin's success this season, Fernando Alonso is the top of the reasons why that is the case. You know, on top of having a good car, he certainly delivered in that. If you took Red Bull out of this championship right now, Fernando would be leading the drivers' championship. And as good as he's been, the only downside for Aston Martin this season is they're not currently P2 in the constructors. If anything, they're actually quite a bit of a way off. It, it does show how good Fernando has been with Aston Martin this season, even when they have been struggling. Yeah, I think if you look at the relative performance that Fernando Alonso has been putting in, and look, we all know what Fernando's like as a character, and love it or hate it, it's the reason why he's a two-time world champion. Um, should have been, in my opinion, more than just two, given the world talent the guy has. But if you have a look at what's going on with Aston Martin, um, with the sort of fallback in form, you worry that if Aston Martin were to continue to, you know, fall away from the uh, competition, would Fernando's patience start to um, start to fall away? And also with the management, I've said it before, Lawrence Stroll started to get impatient. So I think this is a really important second half of the season coming up for um, for Aston Martin, and I'm sure overall they will be happy. But I'm slightly concerned that they're following the the racing point and force India DNA are starting off strong and then getting that developed halfway through the season. Well, that's going to be the big test for them because they, you know, produced some upgrades at Silverstone. They did claim on the wind, uh, you know, on the sim that it was, could potentially put them on par with Red Bull or at least nip it at the heels of them, which was a big claim at the time. But what they've discovered since those upgrades have actually taken them backwards relative to the competition. And now they're going to have to work around that. And that will raise the question, as you said, Courtney, can Aston Martin shake off those old um, stereotypes, if you like, that they are a good team starting out, but they do struggle to develop as the season goes on? They will have to shake that off if they are going to be taken seriously as a big, big, serious team going forward. Let's talk about Mercedes now. B minus we gave them. Uh, Again, another team that's quite difficult to grade because... Mercedes came third last season. They clearly had the third fastest car behind Ferrari and Red Bull. I still think they have the third fastest car at this point in time when you consider all all the elements at the moment. But even though the expectations of them may not necessarily have been win a world championship, even though people would have hoped they would have been in the picture, that is something to mark them down on, if you like. The drivers, especially Sir Lewis Hamilton recently, have been incredibly consistent and I cannot. I can't really think of a team that's been better overall of grasping the opportunities when they come to them and being able to take advantage when they are in a position of strength, and of course mitigating dam- damage limitation situations than Mercedes at this point in time. So, Courtney, h- how do we assess Mercedes' first half of the season? Is a B minus justified, or are we being too harsh or too generous? Um, I, I think the grading's absolutely perfect because you know, where you expect Mercedes to be, obviously where they've, you know, multiple championship winners got, you know, some great minds in the team. Let's be honest, the car still isn't isn't good enough. As simple as that, it, it, unlike McLaren, who seem to have, you know, a big development um, plans 
still to come this season. It seems like um, Mercedes have pretty much given up the ghost. A very, very peaky performance. Very difficult to find the right setup on the car. And as you said, Adam, the reason why we've graded them as high as we have is because of the performances of the two drivers. And it's, and it's frustrating because... You know, if, if Mercedes had a better car, you'd be seeing some great battles between Max Verstappen, Lewis Hamilton, George Russell. Something we've been really keen to see for for at least two years now. So Mercedes needs to do so much better with the car. I do think George Russell uh, needs to restock over the summer. I think he's been getting a little bit erratic lately with his performances. We know he can do better. But let's hope that next year Mercedes come back stronger because it's disappointing for neutral fans to... You know, see the, the the two drivers as talented as they are, sort of scrapping for podiums. Red, really, they should be competing for race wins. Yeah, I don't think we can underestimate how significant that driver pairing has been. Even if there have been some instances where the two of them have uh, been quite close, and it's not really worked out in the best interest of the team. But of course, you know that's something that Mercedes can worry about a little bit further down the line. I don't think it's the biggest problem they have right now in terms of the car lead, though. Corny, you know, made a great point. They started off on the back foot. They were possibly the fourth fastest on the grid at the start of the season. They made some big changes to their car. They abandoned the Hyde Pod concept that they persisted with for some time. And, you know, those upgrades that they introduced at the Monaco Grand Prix does seem to have made a pretty good effect. They were very impressive at the Spanish Grand Prix. They've been pretty decent um, at most of the races since then. And, it does bode well for Mercedes going forward. Obviously, the, the challenge for them now is going to be, can they outdevelop Red Bull to a degree where they put themselves back where they feel they belong, which is right now winning world championships? Yeah, so the, the car, they're obviously not as lost as they were at the beginning of the season. Although right now the car is a bit of a hodgepodge because it's a mix of two concepts. So obviously, they can't uh, make a complete B-spec car as much as they would have loved to. There's obviously the cost cap to take into consideration um now but the so they're never going to unlock the new potential of this new concept that they're going to try and pursue obviously that's going to be next year um but the fact that they still seem a bit lost in extracting performance that sometimes that the car has potential and speed in there but they can't unlock it on a weekend week out um although the car is still good it doesn't it doesn't it's not always the second fastest car or the third fastest car, and sometimes it drops, and some pe- it's a very peaky, as you already uh, alluded to. So I think that is very frustrating um, for them regarding understanding the car in its current um, condition and when the upgrades are not always bringing them what they want or expecting to deliver. Uh, and they're having a good season, but this is not the Mercedes, what Mercedes are going to be expecting or wanting from this year. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll have to wait and see how that goes. But Mercedes at the moment, probably rightly tagged as the team most likely to challenge Red Bull at this point in time. Of course, a uh, bit of news regarding Total Wolf uh, f- having an accident falling off his bike and breaking his elbow, or fracturing his elbow, we should say. And a uh, few pictures of him in the cast doing the rounds on social media. So uh, get well soon, Toto. I-, I guess it just goes without saying, guys, um, not to be too whimsical on this, that the rule of thumb seems to be at the moment if you're an F1 driver, don't get on a bike yeah. because we had lot, obviously Total Wolf, Lance Stroll, Fernando Alonso a couple of years ago. And uh, yeah, it's uh, probably not probably not the one for drivers. I don't expect to see an F1 driver in the Tour de France anytime soon. No, so obviously it's, it's a very good cardio exercise for their, their fitness, but mm. it's a bit of a risky uh, exercise. Better stick to the, the um, in the gym. Uh, you're less likely to fall off your bike there. Well, that's it. Um, I mean, I know F1 drivers are probably told that they shouldn't be doing certain activities because of the risk of injury. I don't imagine cycling would have been one of them, but uh, maybe it should be uh, going forward. We'll have to wait and see. Red Bull, last but certainly not least of all. Very easy grade. We were all unanimous in this one. A+, A+, and I don't think we've ever given an A+, rating on this show since we've been doing these mid-season reviews. I don't think many people probably have before this season, but... I don't think you could really argue anything against Red Bull as a collective. Um, They've just been anything short of flawless, really, or if anything close to it. They, Especially Max Verstappen, of course. They've won every race so far this season. And 
there are some questions regarding certain elements of this team. You know, obviously Sergio Perez, there is a dynamic there that we need to address. But first things first, the team have been superb. Max Verstappen has been formidable. He's reaching even bigger heights despite the car being very dominant. But right now, everything he seems to be touching in that Red Bull car is turning to gold at this point in time. Um, guys, we've been throwing praise at Max all season long, but at the first half of the season, how? what can we say about Red Bull? Uh, well, overall, it's a amazing performance. Um, obviously, we're actually talking about a team that could potentially win every race this season and break McLaren's 35-year record. Um, and it, when you say, as oh, what could the team do better this year? They've lost a couple of poles, and when the drivers aren't, um, isn't coming second every race, but it's still sitting second in the championship. And if that's your negatives, what an epic season they're having. It really is. Um, I, and I think you summed it up perfectly there, that if we're truly really trying to claw at negatives, we're probably, if we talked about any other team in this regard, we'd be being uber harsh, but we have to try and find something that Red Bull can improve on because that's the nature of Formula One. They're always looking for the smallest percentages or the smallest amounts of gains. But as a collective Red Bull, they, it is unprecedented what they're doing at this point in time. Even if the, the pace deficit or the pace advantage they have to everyone else is not as great as perhaps other dominant eras have shown because of the natural field spread in Formula 1, they are taking this dominance game to a completely different level in Max Verstappen's hands. Yeah, I, I think the big thing that's different this time is the reliability. Um, we've seen historically with um, with Age and New Design cars because he wants the cars to be so aerodynamically efficient. We saw it famously during his McLaren years and with the early um, Red Bull cars in the Turbo Hybrid era, because the cars are so aerodynamically efficient and tightly packed, you'd often see reliability issues with the cars. But even now, it, the, the reliability is perfect. The engine power is so much better, thanks to the work that Honda have put in. And the, the run of the team, the pit stops, just everything apart from, his, as you guys have already said, um, some of Sergio Perez's performances, it, you, would, you would say it's... The perfect season for Red Bull. I think in terms of F1, it, it doesn't really get much better. And it is the equivalent of playing F1, the F1 game on easy mode. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the one asterisk, of course, we have to talk about with Red Bull in an otherwise flawless season so far to a degree is Sergio Perez. As you pointed out, Lee, second in the championship at this point in time, but that tells only a portion of his first half of the season so far, which has otherwise been more underwhelming than impressive, if we're being brutally honest. And I think if we're looking at anything that Red Bull have to be better at in this second half of the season, it has to be Perez. He has to be in a position, at the very, very least, where he is finishing second or being able to take advantage if Max Verstappen does have a problem and get the win for Red Bull at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, considering the the difference um, between the top teams and Red Bull, um, Sergio should be a guaranteed podium every race. The fact that he's not been on the podium every race shows you how up and down his season has been. Yeah, there may be a strategy called that, oh, a team can maybe leapfrog and get a set of P2, but he should always be on on, on that podium. And I really, right, he does, he's not unlocking the performance of Max, but he, as you said, be P2, it's such a dominant car that why not why can't he achieve that and I think that's really um hurting Sergio and obviously he had a great start himself personally but he just fell away as we got into the mid-season um and obviously he's had a few good stronger performances as of late but hopefully he can carry that on to the second half of the season well I mean we talk about strong performances I mean the recovery drives and even then you know that they're not quite the level that what Red Bull will be hoping for yeah. I mean I, I might be wrong in this but in Belgium, Perez got his first podium since, what was it, Baku, when he won that race, unless I'm mistaken. And that's like a seven race streak without a podium, um, or six or seven. And in all of those races, he's out, he's been out-qualified, not just by his teammate, but by quite a few other drivers as well, or he's not even made it to Q3, for example. And even then, you'd, you'd have argued the case that he should have at least got to try and get to P2, and he hasn't been able to do that. In Belgium, he managed to do that, but that's because he qualified quite high. So naturally, you're going to think, well, okay, well, that's fair enough. 
And this is the problem with Sergio Perez. I'm I'm a bit concerned that what happened in Monaco really affected him. You know, he was in a great vein of form. He did a great job performing against his teammate by winning in Jeddah and also winning in Baku, although Baku was probably much more on merit than Jeddah was, with all respect, because of Max's grid uh, penalty at the start of the race. But since then, the form has really, really fell off. And I'm wondering if this is because Perez is putting too much pressure and emphasis on trying to win the World Championship against Max Verstappen. And I want to get your thoughts on this because... I I don't want to be too critical, Sergio, but I feel like a sense of realism needs to be injected here, if if I may. When you look at Red Bull and you look at the revenue that they bring in, I heard on you know from somewhere that around sixty percent of all the Red Bull merch and, and and drinks that are bought to this company are bought in Mexico. And Sergio Perez is going to play a huge part in that. And it's probably a big reason as to why he's driving that car. Not the only reason, because he's a very good driver. And I think he deserves to be there on merit, today at least. You know, in the future, that might be different. But he turns up and he has exasperations and ambitions to want to be world champion and beat Max Verstappen. Now, bear in mind, Sergio Perez, what is he now, 32, 33? You know, he, he's the generation before the likes of the Norrises, the Verstappens, the Leclerc's, the Russells, for example. He's that one before that. And one distinct difference I notice between Sergio Perez and Max Verstappen is what they do when they're not at a Grand Prix weekend. And Sergio Perez is, you know, spending time with his family, doing certain events, or he might be doing some stuff at the Red Bull factory or stuff like that. You see that on his socials if you follow it. What I see from Max Verstappen on the sim, on the sim, on the sim, whether it's at home or whether it's at the Red Bull factory. More often you see him at home on the sim. And you get these new generation of drivers now. And Max has very much pioneered this, in my opinion, in the same way that Schumacher did many years ago when he was really up in his fitness game and taking that to F1 and setting a new dynamic there to be ahead of everybody else and better than everyone else in that regard. And it turned out to be that way on the track as well. We're seeing this from Max Verstappen. And for me... As, as I don't want to be harsh on Sergio Perez here. I really, really don't, because I like the guy. I think he's a very good driver, and I want him to do well. But when I see Max Verstappen, who's at the top of his game right now, getting better and better and better all the time, and he's going to get even better as the years go on, and he's a two-time, soon-to-be three-time world champion. He's nearly won 50 races already in his career, and he's still banging out hour after hour after hour after hour on the sim rig, whether it be at home or at work. My, my solution to Sergio Perez, work harder, mate. Honestly, work harder. I don't see what Perez is doing every single day, but from what I see on their socials, which I know is only a certain portion of their of their um, of their work week or what their normal days are like outside of driving an F1 car, but if I'm seeing the world champion all the time on his socials, always on the sim rig or practicing, and and the guy loves to race, and this is why he's doing it for me, I just think, well, I know you have aspirations to be world champ, mate. And this goes to anyone else who wants to try and do the same thing against Max Verstappen. You've got to work harder. Because if Max Verstappen is doing that, and he's as good as he is, what? why should I expect someone who's not as good as Max, who's not putting in the same hours and work and, and, and effort as he is, to do better? I just It just doesn't add up, quite frankly. It's like it's like ask, expecting me to go out and beat Usain Bolt in a sprint race, and yet Usain's training every day of the week, and I'm just sitting on the couch thinking, that's all right, I'll do it later. Like, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, I think he needs to look at um, Nico Rosberg. Um, I think, obviously, famously, Lewis, Lewis doesn't really spend as much time on the on the sim compared to Max, but what Nico Rosberg had to do, he, he got you know he got beaten in 2014, 2015 by Lewis, uh, fairly convincingly in 2015. And Nico had to take himself away, restock, and work himself so hard to beat Lewis to the point of like mental breakdown where he had to leave, retire from Formula One for his own health. That's a level of um, dedication that Nico had to put in to challenge a driver of um, Lewis's calibre. And Max is the driver of this generation, so you're right. Um, whether it be healthy or unhealthy, the harsh reality is you have to put in so much work and dedication to challenge Max because Max is pretty much the ceiling for the next 15 years. He's the level that the rest of the drivers are going to have to aim for. And a lot of hard work, as you said, Adam, will have to go in to, you know, equal him and challenge him. Well, I mean, look at Lewis now. 
you know, even Lewis is doing sim work. And this is a driver that hated doing sim work, but because he was immensely talented and gifted, he was ahead of the curve of everybody. He's taken Verstappen to come in and really change things in that dynamic. And, and obviously Mercedes not to be where they are or where they used to be to change that element. And, and even Lewis is working even harder than he was already, which was pretty hard to begin with. With Perez, as I said already, you know, we can go on about it and say the guy just needs to work harder. And I think he does in that regard. Those certain things that you have to do to try and find those extra temp here and there, like Rosberg was doing, as you mentioned, Corny, that is, that's the standard. If you want to be a world champion, that's what you've got to do, regardless of the car that you're driving. And, you know, the second half of the season is going to be a very good barometer for Perez because whilst we mentioned already that he brings a lot of revenue and commercial opportunities to this team, that is not going to be enough to keep him in that car going forward. Red Bull are not going to reduce Perez to just being a pay driver indirectly, of course, just to keep him around. They're more than happy to look around and find someone else that can do a better job in the car than he is if he's not up to it. Oh, yeah. I mean, they as a team, they're dominating this season, but that's not going to be a guaranteed um, thing for the future. And they have to think what happens if uh, we're going to be fighting a close championship battle. And right now, if they were, they'll probably be losing if um, because of Sergio's performances. Absolutely. Um, but guys, of course, that's all we've got time for for this mid-season review. We've covered quite a lot there. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that. But do let us know in the comment section if you're listening to this podcast on YouTube what your letter grades are for each team so far this season just a reminder we're basing this on what the expectations were for the team based on how they've performed not necessarily based on championship order or anything like that if that's confused anybody so do let us know in the comments and let us know what you think of our grades do you agree with them we'll put them in the description just as a reminder so you don't have to go back and forth with this episode to uh, remind yourself of what we scored the teams of course as always if you are watching this on youtube make sure to like the video subscribe to the channel and of course don't forget to leave us a five star review on your favorite podcasting platform it really does help us out a lot and we really appreciate your support so we'll be back next week for the dutch grand prix preview f1 is coming back and whilst it's been a nice little break to get away from f1 and recharge the batteries i am very much looking forward to seeing f1 come back will red bull win every race remaining this season or will we see a new driver on the top step of the podium we'll have to wait and see but until then thanks for tuning in as always please stay safe and we will see you in the next episode of the dnf1 f1 podcast and remember as always if you're not first you're probably dnf1 take care see you soon goodbye